Hello and welcome to Social Founder Stories, the podcast for everyone interested in inspirational stories about charities and social enterprises. I'm your host, Caroline Deal, and I'm the founder of two charities, the Media Trust and Together TV. I well know the joys and challenges of being a social founder. Social Founder Stories are about the amazing people who make social change happen. People who use their passions, skills, and entrepreneurial drive to make a difference and to make our world a better place. You'll hear about what makes social founders tick, how they create impact, what they struggle with, and how they overcome their challenges, or not in some cases. Social Founder Stories is brought to you by the Social Founder Network in association with Kiva, the Center for Innovation in Voluntary Action. You can find out more about Kiva and support their innovative work at www.kiva.org.uk. In this episode of Social Founder Stories, Sarah Corbett, founder of the iconic Craftivist Collective, tells us that she is at heart an introvert. Describing herself as a reluctant social founder, she says she was also an activist in the womb with her first action at the age of three. Passionate about both craft and activism, Sarah is using what she calls the gentle art of stitching to engage people around the world in social justice issues. Sarah's founder journey, her brilliant use of social media, her craftivist workshops and her fast-selling how to be a craftivist book, all come together to create a powerful story about how one social founder can have far-reaching impact for individuals, for communities, and globally. I'm so super excited to have you with us, Sarah, for this oh, podcast. Well, it's always a joy to chat to you. Yeah? <laughs> Any well, excuse? <laughs> do, well, do you know what? It was actually, I think, when we went out for a drink one time that I thought, I've got to do a podcast because all Did I you? wanted to do was when we were having our drink and our chat and our nibbles. And we had some pizza, I think. We probably did. Yeah. <laughs> all I, we were down by the canal, weren't yeah, we? Yeah, we were. Hackney. All I wanted to do was question you. <laughs> How did you do this? Why did you do this? When did you do this? How did you make it happen? Da, da, da. And so now I've got the most amazing excuse Brilliant. to ask you all those <laughs> questions and really drill down and just hear your story because I am so in awe of what you do. And it's oh, quite unique and quite original, really, what you do. It's a bit weird, yeah. It's <laughs> wonderful. Well, what's so brilliant about it, and we, we, you can tell, tell our listeners in a minute, what's so brilliant about it is that it's, it is weird in that it's very original mm. but actually it's using something that women in particular yeah for millions of years and generations have done it's yeah. kind of like something yeah. that's very very ordinary and was a bit lost so tell us what you do first of all as a summary i run the craftivist collective so it's all about craftivism which is activism using craft so particularly handicraft so i use hand embroidery and paper craft not other forms of craft so not ceramics or glasswork or and for me it's a tool in the activism toolkit so it's really useful sometimes to help you slow down use the process of crafting with the repetitive action to think deeply about the issue think empathetically um, and also think strategically about how to be an effective campaigner and how big is it now that craft was collected? How do you measure the yeah. size of it? Oh, you've got it's really hard when amazing... people say how many are in the collective. Yeah, you've got an amazing social media following, haven't you? I'm jealous. It's active. I mean, it's not as big as the Kardashians, but, you know, <laughs> as social founders know we're not going to be that popular. Sarah we... the Kardashian, I think I know, that's imagine. a good nickname, actually. Yeah, so because I provide kits and tools and events and workshops and collaborations, we've got people all over the world that take part on their own. We have groups that take part, whether it's women's institutes or campaign groups, girl guides, scouts, lots of different people use our projects and kits and tools. And then we've got people who've set up their own craftivist groups that meet regularly, sometimes weekly, sometimes monthly. So it's hard to say how many are in the collective because it's whoever wants to get involved. Yeah. Often they talk and share things online that yeah. I love. Yeah. Um, but it's definitely thousands of people. And, and um, tens of thousands of followers. Yeah, 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 yeah. And growing well. all of the time, yeah. which yeah. is great. 
And before we go into sort of all your, your founder journey, you're working outside the UK quite a lot in the I States. I am now, maybe? yeah, a lot in. So I, I'm based in London and my mm. background's campaigning, so I know the campaign sector well. So I still do a lot of consultancy and collaborations there. Uh -huh. But more so now in America, there's a real, I think because in our context here in the UK, it's very similar in America, which is good and bad. Yeah. Um, quite a bit in Australia. I haven't travelled to Australia because my carbon footprint I'm aware of. <laughs> but there's a lot of interest in Nordic countries. I do a lot in America, Australia. And then, you know, we have some craftivists in Thailand. And it seems to be relevant for different people. And it's difficult with the collective because it is global. So I always try and make sure everything's accessible for people wherever they are, but also some campaigns I do are very issue specific mm. with a particular goal, with particular targets in a certain context. So it's juggling a lot with the focus of where can I have most impact? Where right. can I be of most use? Let's really <laughs> drill down around the digital stuff as well, because yeah. I think that's very interesting for lots of social founders and yeah. campaigners about how we use digital or yeah. not versus the face-to-face -face stuff. And especially in your case with all the With it being so hands-on, yeah. it's quite strange in a way that it works so well online because it's so physical, Yeah, which I think is fascinating. So, so tell me sort of, where did where did this come from? Is it is, is being a campaigner in your DNA? Is being a is being a founder yeah. in your DNA? And campaigners and founders aren't necessarily the same. They're thing. really not. For me, it's felt like looking back in retrospect, it feels very organic rather than forced. I'm a for me, I'm an activist. I always have been. I grew up in West Everton in Liverpool in the eighties. Uh -huh. My dad is still the local vicar minister there, so he's never left, which is unusual. Nice. My mum was a nurse then a full-time mum and now she's a politician and she's quite high up in the city council so we always talked about local inequality uh -huh. we squ I was three when we squatted to save a row of social housing in the area so which you were we saved three. I was three you years were three old when you first started I was well my mum says I was an activist in the womb because <laughs> we always had it. lots of community meetings around the kitchen table so there was all all of our conversations growing up were about politics and religion and people of different religions and people working together of all faiths and none and you know all of our mugs in the kitchen were basically campaign mugs of like anti-apartheid in South Africa or peace mugs or nice. Martin Luther King posters around the house yeah. and so for me I see that campaigning can make real change which me makes me keep doing it because I know it can work but I also know how bloody difficult it is to do but my skill I see my main skill is I am a good campaigner I worked I you know grew up in that world campaigned at school as head girl and won some campaigns and lost others what kind of campaigns do you so do? I questioned everything Great. but always yeah. quite shy and introverted so this weird balance um and students always ask for lockers every year because we never had lockers and we always carry heavy bags around. So mm. the first thing I did was to say to the head teacher, why don't we have lockers? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And she said, it's health and safety reason. And I thought, well, is it? Because yeah. I don't think it is. So I asked the caretaker who I knew and said, do you think, Mr. Gilbert, do you think this is, is health and safety? And he said, I'm not sure. I said, well, could we figure out if it is? So we measured all the rooms and the corridors, realised it wasn't health and safety. I then, with my campaign background as a 16-year-old, it was like, who are the people who've, who have got the decision makers? Who's got the power? So I knew one parent governor was the most influential, spoke to them, Love spoke it. to some of the teachers, found out how much it costs and put a case forward and said it is in health and safety these are the reasons for and against got the parent governors on board which the teachers have to listen to more than the pupils yep. so I didn't do a petition or a march or a demo but we got lockers because of this very hidden quiet activism in a way and that for me always stayed with me as you can change things without having to do big loud aggressive stuff I'd set stuff up reluctantly, so I never wanted to lead or found anything, but I'd see a gap and think something needs to be done. And then, so I've only ever worked in activism, yeah. but I always saw the big flaws of if we throw milkshakes at politicians, they're not going to listen to yeah, us. Yeah. You know, I always read 
we were talking about what books in um, our emails about what books inspire me in my work and I regularly look at the Strength to Love Book of Sermons by Martin Luther King because it's so rooted in emotional intelligence, in neuroscience, he refers to different philosophers, different religious leaders of it's... how you can do effective campaigning where everyone can be part of it and it's a loving form of activism that works. So that's been a real driver for you, the Martin Luther King stuff. I noticed yeah, you've got Martha, Martin Luther King mugs on your Twitter feeds. And I like did yesterday. He is so, yeah. so inspirational. I think he's the most amazing campaigner there yeah. ever was and I watch, I get everyone to watch Selma, the film, because I think it shows a lot about strategic activism. Yeah, it's fantastic. It's, and it's, and the music's so beautiful, I cry all yeah. the time. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and the soundtrack's beautiful. I loved it, actually. Yeah. It made me cry as well. Yeah. Really, really fantastic. But there's a scene in it when, because I get, attract lots of people who are scared of loud, angry activism or people who are burnt out activists, lots of introverts who want to be the change they want to see in the world but don't know how to do it and care about issues. Mm. So one of the many products I do is this well-making clinic where I basically have a one-to-one -one with a prescription card that I give people to say what's stopping you from being that change you want to see on this issue you care about. So I'm like the doctor and they're the patient. So you do it as a one-to-one -one thing? Yeah, it which is really intimate and lovely. And then I write them three prescriptions of, it might be a film to watch or Positive News magazine, which yeah, I both know we love, wonderful, which yes. helps with anxiety or strategy, you know, a power analysis, and I show them how to do it. But Selma, there's one scene where Martin Luther King and his core group are having some chicken in someone's house in Selma. Yeah. and they're just talking for a few minutes about who has the most power in Selma to change this law, to tackle this injustice. Do we go for the police? Do we go for the mayor? Do we go for... And how do we engage them? Is it something where we do want media because they'll only listen to that? Or does it need a quiet conversation? And I think that's such an incredible scene for all activists to... Oh think like what would Martin Luther King what would what would Martin Luther King do brilliant, what brilliant. would he think so so le before we go on to how you set up the Craftivist Collective yeah. you said you worked for some campaigning organizations yeah, after university so yeah. what was that like who did you work for and I worked, uh, what did it feel like yeah so I I'd always campaigned with different groups I was part of the Liverpool Friends of the Earth group part of Amnesty at University always part of stuff and then I'm from a low-income area there's still a big problem in the charity sector you have to intern for free and yep. in London and there's no way me or my family could have afforded that and Christian Aid were the only international development charity that did a, a paid internship for a year and then I worked for them full-time and then I worked for Oxfam as uh -huh. a campaign manager climate change maternal health yeah. inequality always global but uk campaigns because it was oxfam gb national campaigns and resources and tactics as well as training up local groups and mobilizing individuals so it was a big job and it was a lot of work yeah. but really useful um, and i've always campaigned on local issues just as a, a constituent so i've always had that balance of local and global nice yeah. nice nice um so tell us, where did the spark come? What was the driver for? Because yeah. you presumably could have gone up the career path oh, yeah. very easily. My grandmother, in... bless her, is always like, you were doing so well at Oxfam. <laughs> I'm sure they'd have you back. <laughs> Thanks, Nan. <laughs> so did you just decide to... Tell, tell no, us. No, I, um, I started... What happened? So it was, te it was literally 10 years ago. I mm -hmm. felt like I was completely burning out as an activist in my personal life and the work I was doing, a lot of the training of, of young campaigners was sign this, you know, sign petitions, go on marches, do stunts. And I felt like it was very transactional, not rooted in holistic thinking of strategy, often very reactive. Mm. Or sometimes a lot of campaigning can be quite ego-led of what makes us feel better or what do the public like to do that we can attract them in, which for me, for campaigning to be effective, you have to serve the cause because mm -hmm. otherwise you can be discredited as this is all about you or this mm. is you know, an excuse for you to throw bricks through windows or all of that. And there wasn't a form, a, a tool in the activism toolkit to help people slow down, think more strategically, which craft naturally does. Mm -hmm. A tool to, to build a relationship with power holders, whether it's politicians or board members or CEOs, 
to be critical friends with them rather than aggressive enemies and when you hand make something for someone it's incredibly powerful because we're not used to it it's physical it's not perfect it's humble activism it's about them not you and then also I do lots of small and beautiful street art that provokes people rather than preachers at them and they have to find it whether it's hanging up somewhere below eye level or whether it's found in pockets yeah. which we can talk about I can't wait to and I found more about that. I found that this small form of of activism that was again handmade to show people's commitment to the issue and intriguing worked so well to share online but create conversations with people and there wasn't those types of activism offered so I was tinkering to be like I really feel like these are useful in the toolkit not to replace other forms of activism but to add into it so did you start did you start doing this as a sort of almost like a side project oh yeah so what was your journey for yeah because I think we've got uh, what's really surprised me with the social founder network which is quite new which still. I love as oh, well so good you. Um, what surprised me is that loads of young people and actually older people as well are yeah. coming up to me saying, "Oh, I want. To, I'm thinking of becoming a founder, a social founder as well. How do I do it?" Can you advise? I know, and I get that quite a bit from people of all ages. And I think you can see. Tell me if you disagree. It concerns me. Like I did this as a hobby outside of my job because uh-huh. I was like, I want to tinker to see if this actually works. And were you still working full time? I was working full time, and I was working full time for five years while I was doing the craftivism because wow. I was tinkering on my own yeah. then my friends and family were saying what are you doing <laughs> so I set up a little blog just for them to see it yeah. because they kept asking and I'm an introvert so I like being on my own <laughs> <laughs> I know we want to hear more about this yeah. introvert. I can't imagine so then, an introvert. so then I set up the blog and within two months I had people in America and Australia and the UK who I didn't know saying can I join in I'm burnt out as well or I think that this quiet activism is needed and all of these things I was talking about so for me it came out of me going oh crap I can't do this on my own because people want to join in and there's no one else doing it the word craftivism existed in 2003 so when I googled craft and activism when I saw these different elements of the Mm. process the product and the public sphere of how it could help I thought there's something in this but the word was craft plus activism equals craftivism. It was a lot about knitting groups, meeting and talking together, but then often doing make, do and mend or politics with a small P of just mm-hmm. general discussions. Whereas for me as an activist, I was always thinking, how can we use this, these products and this process to really help with real campaigning that's not just awareness raising and it's not fundraising it has to be you know challenging systems and structures yeah. and did you so did you see a gap yes that's the so that's um, for me is the main thing is i saw no one else was doing what i was doing the woman who coined the term is american said anyone can use the word so i talk about how my approach to craftivism is gentle protest but there's uh-huh. other forms out there so it's uh-huh. a bit like the word punk you've got all these different <laughs> punk bands that sound different but under that umbrella and then when people wanted to join in i got a cluster of strangers and friends in london saying you're in london can we do it together nice. so reluctantly because i knew it burnt me out to do more be part of more and more groups when I was already part of lots I met 10 people in the cafe in the British Library and said okay what does this look like what's our name what do you want to do and again all voluntarily seeing what it would what would work and I only I left I went part-time in my job at Oxfam in order to be able because there was so much demand so I never promoted what I did I never asked for media or asked people to join it was always that people said to me can I join in Um, and I was getting emails from beautiful magazines that had never covered activism or social change before saying can we do a double page feature on you can you create some events some projects for our readers so we give you six pages in the magazine and then I was getting the South Bank and big museums and galleries saying can you come and do craftivism events that link in with our exhibitions because we want our audience want to engage with social change but they can't can't be party political and it can't be explicitly political but some of the stuff you're doing could totally work so with all of these requests I I couldn't leave without being financially stable because I don't 
have other income yeah. happening. Yeah, this is- and I was too scared to take the leap. So I went part time and my job wasn't letting me do that. Yeah. And then I got a project with Save the Children that was a big national project for 10 months yeah. that was equivalent of part time wage that I knew that. I had to focus on all of that together, so I left my job. After talking to my family, this is really scary and risky because no, no one in my family are founders or entrepreneurs. We're, we, we've, you know, my dad's a vicar on a small wage. My mum was a nurse. You know, it, yeah. we always and grew up on a very low budget. So I think they were nervous of me leaving a, and you a good were, job. You were living in London, having to pay London rent, rent and London all of that. All so that everyone, was, I was very reluctant to found something it was never a goal and was it all, so you were the, the save the children job by the way was that contract was that linked to the craft of it? oh yeah, it? yeah it was it them was... saying you're get, you've got a growing following of crafts people mm-hmm. and people who aren't engaged in traditional activism can we work with you to engage them on this big national campaign and we talked through the collaboration i'm very stubborn so i said no at first because i didn't think it fitted and then i said <laughs> this is how we work I love- so i stick to my ethos and my methodology which isn't going to get thousands of people quickly for quick transactions that are super simple and easy like I challenge everyone with craft of thought questions while Mm -hmm. they're stitching we think through what messages you're using is it ethical resources so lots of people want small budgets with cheap resources and I'm like if you're talking about social change we need ethical resources Mm -hmm. so all of that makes my job more difficult I could get way more followers if I did super simple you know resources and kits say and cross stitch and make tea not war but that's what war and what tea and actually quickly before we go yeah. on to the kits when you were talking about the sort of organic growth and mm. you feeling like a reluctant absolute, social founder which I, I love reluctant. that phrase that's going, down, that's going down in the history of the social founder network now the <laughs> reluctant social founder when you were when you're getting all these people coming up to you was that it was that on the basis of your blog Initially. The blog, lots and of word just... of mouth. So again, the UK charity sector is small, so people are like, do you know this weird stuff Sarah's doing? Right. What do you think of it? And people are very cynical. And I had to, what was great was I was cynical as well, thinking, what's this? The world's <laughs> imploding and I'm cross-stitching. Um, <laughs> so I had to make sure I could back up what I was doing mm. and constantly trying to capture the impact. And really, I read a lot of neuroscience and psychology, which all my work's based on, uh-huh. as well as, you know, what Gandhi did, I'm always like, you know, this links in with nonviolent work. And, and so, did you carry on writing the blog all the way through? Well, this? no, because um, I don't really write. I wrote the book because I wasn't writing down all of my thought processes, and then people would come to workshops and talks and be like, I didn't know there was so much strategy behind it. Mm-hmm. I was like, if there isn't strategy, it's not very effective. So I was reluctant, but I made kits because, again, people around the world were saying, we need more support, do you have kits? Yeah. And I thought, okay, there's a demand for kits. And then there was um, organizations around the world saying, we need, to, we need your methodology. I created the manifesto to say, this is our 10 point process. Mm-hmm. So now WWF have used it to change the law in Spain by using the manifesto. Your manifesto? Yeah. So the because craftivist manifesto, the heads of campaigns emailed me saying, don't know if you realize, but we used your manifesto and we changed cheeky. the law in Spain <laughs> to protect migrant and beds, which isn't cheeky. It's brilliant. It's- and it's very humbling to be like, they could download that for free and use it without me. So there's this tension, I think, with social enterprise as well, is you need to make a living, but yeah. you want to have impact. I was going to ask you about and so working much. And working in so activism, it's about. really hard, because by saying you need to buy an ethical kit, which is £12, because it's ethical, yeah. people go, what, I have to buy activism? So tell us about the kits, because really you were saying that yeah. you didn't want to do the sort of mass-produced kits. Yeah, make, so but, I what, make what, them all in my flat, which oh is not God, sustainable. I never knew that. Yeah, I have a little video on Instagram of me working on my ironing board on my sofa yeah. in my little studio apartment, which is any social founder will know is not scale upable unless I get people to help me do it. But and I need to do that because so it's how, more and more demand. How many do you make a week 
or a month? Oh, it's really sporadic. So lots of evenings. Depends. I'm doing a national project with Heritage Open Days at the moment, so I've got to make 500 kits that are bespoke for them. And you'll make these all individually, or do you have a team now? No, I make them. And I used to have volunteers, but the quality control was a bit tough. And I'd like to pay people, but at the moment I don't have enough to pay people. But it's something I'm looking into, and I need funding for stuff like that. So it's, it's messy, but... Again, coming from the journey, it was people wanted to be part of the craftivism that I was doing, so the collective was founded. Then organisations wanted me to do events, so I did that. Then people wanted kits. Then people wanted more info. And I'd done so many successful and measurable campaigns where you could learn from the mistakes and the... You know, everything I'd done, I'd done practically, so it felt like a really good time to write the book to say, here's all of my learning, and it's fully rooted in case studies of what I've done it's not just a theory here's what we've changed whether it's hearts and minds or policies and And we're really excited about the book because it's just come out in paperback paperback. with a lovely quote from the observer put it all over our social media and website as well so the observer quote says this is mindful activism thought out strategic and engaging and you've got amazing quotes all over social media about the book as I know well. which is how many, lovely how many copies of the hardback book have we you sold, sold 7,000 which Fantastic. I think people think books sell loads but actually that's pretty good well, and for an unknown hardback and for hardback sell. and you published yeah. it through Unbound I, I did so what was that like really process. good because you get the power of veto which you don't get in any other publishing houses mm-hmm. but it's yeah. selling so well it's selling well and, and it's reaching people all over the world and so what's great is these cynical people who go craftivism sounds a bit meh I can say yeah it can and some craftivism out in the world isn't strategic and I know- challenge people but because everything's based in real case studies, I can say, look, here's the ways it can be useful in the toolkit, here's where it might not be. Mm-hmm. So it's a really good, and it's a good brain dump because I don't blog and I don't write as you much as I should. Blogging, no, like, I need to blog as we all need to, but I just don't have the headspace and there's so many demands, it's hard to know what to say but yes also, to. And, and we'll come on to the money in a bit, presumably it's quite good to sell the book. Yeah. Um, I've noticed actually the book seems to be being used as a present that people are buying oh, yeah, it to massively. give to people yeah. old and young yeah which I love and I sell it on my website as well where you can get it wrapped and ribboned for free and I can sign it and I get lots of people saying this is for my daughter or my friends in hospital this is for her to yeah. read so I write little messages yeah. in for them talking yeah. about things that are beautifully wrapped and ribboned yeah I heard about your campaign where you put the little well, you're going to have to tell us what it is, where you put the little bits of paper and we'll get little these uh, mini, fashion, mini statements. fashion statements in clothing. But bizarrely, around, it was about Christmas time, I was coming home late one night and there was this funny little piece of white paper on the pavement outside my house when I was bringing my bike into my front door. And I thought, that's a weird little bit of rubbish. What is it? I'll pick it up. Yeah. And it was one of your little scrolls. Which I... Beautifully written by hand. And it didn't have the ribbon, which I've I've seen and and you've brought one. Yeah. And we'll we'll see on the website. But tell us about those. Tell us about some of the campaigns now, including that this amazing one, which has really caught my imagination. And then we'll come back to... Yeah. The money because oh, I, I really, which really, we have really, to talk about, especially I really as want to understand women. How I think. you, yeah, well, as 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 women and as social founders, yeah. um, because the, you know, this is a classic thing that all founders apparently pay themselves less than they I really know. should. So true, and less than they pay other staff. And I'm or really strict at paying people and paying them well, and then it comes to me, and I'm like. Oh, it's fine. Me too. Yeah, Me too. Yeah. But but let's let's talk about your amazing campaigns because that's at the heart of everything. Yeah, I mean, I haven't. I've got eight projects um, that people can buy kits for. Which, if you think over the years, like you know, you'd expect me to uh-huh. churn out lots of new ones. But the way I think and why I think it's impactful is I'm always looking at where's the gaps and where can craftivism add to right. campaigns so the mini fashion statements which are paper scrolls and they're ribboned in um like luxury color ribbon turquoise purple and mauve is me seeing fashion revolution as this incredible campaign that's set up by two fashion designers after the rana plaza disaster yes. where over a thousand people were killed in a in a factory in bangladesh and i loved their campaign and because they're fashion designers so they were saying we love fashion but we know it could be the industry needs to be as as beautiful as the clothes and it was very positive and they were engaging 
people who love fashion, which was very different to existing campaigns that were very much about activist groups saying, you can't love fashion. We've got to hate the whole part of fashion. And I love fashion. I love mm. Vogue. So I felt like we were really not engaging people who love fashion in the fashion industry. Mm. But all of their campaigns at the time were about people doing... Um, doing a hashtag, taking a picture of their clothes, adding on social media the company that had made the clothes, uh-huh. and then doing a hashtag saying, who made my clothes? So really good, curious activism where the brand really should reply saying, oh, this person or this country. So it was very clever campaigning, yeah. but everything they were doing was online, and I thought, okay, you're going to reach a certain audience, but what about people who were buying clothes from those fast fashion stores how do we engage them without them feeling judged or harassed especially if they're on a low income or they've got other issues um, and capacities so I made these little fashion statements which are paper scrolls on watercolour paper so the texture is something that again coming back to neuroscience if you engage in two or more senses you remember something more so you want to touch it the colours are luxury colours I have three messages that I worked with an amazing sustainability agency communications agency called Futera oh yeah I've heard of who and Solitaire's an amazing social founder there I worked with them and I paid them with gingerbreads, which they were happy for one lunchtime and said, you're so good at wording and this needs to be worded really Mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. They'd worked with Fashion Revolution before. And over a lunchtime, we came up with three messages that were poetic, how you read them or were questions of what's the story behind this item of clothing? Uh Is it a joyful one or is it a painful one? Find out at FashRev. Um, One saying, you know, clothes maketh the person. That's a big thing. You know, what makes your clothes? Or our values are threaded through everything we do and wear. What values are threaded through this item of clothes? And then they're small. So you handwrite the message as a craftivist very slowly in your neatest handwriting in a fountain pen or a gel pen. So it feels special. And then you put on the outside, please open me in lowercase with a smiley face and a kiss in your prettiest handwriting so it's non-aggressive and attractive. And you drop them in pockets inside shops that you think could be more ethical, whether it's a shirt pocket or a bag. And it's anonymous, but it has at FashRev at the bottom for people to find out more. So you're not just giving them a statement that they then don't know what to do with. And FashRev have an amazing website with lots of ways they can be part of the, the solution. And you shop drop them. So I, in my head, I thought this is a great offline thing to support fashion revolution. I knew I could take beautiful images so that the media would want to share it, especially fashion blogs and fashionistas. They'd want to be part of it without feeling demonized. So you got lots of media coverage in fashion fashion magazines. My target was fashion magazines, um, creative websites, people who don't engage possibly in social change or the ugly side of the fashion Mm -hmm. industry how could I make something that they wanted to engage with in an attractive way rather than a guilt way and we got in fashion blogs we got on a website called business of fashion which anyone in the fashion industry knows is very influential within the sector we got on the home page of the BBC news website which is one of the biggest websites in the world Huffington Post double page spread in the Guardian huge amounts of media and I also knew that the project would be the only project I could do as a good drop-in session with all of these museums and galleries that wanted me to do sessions. I've taken it to the Barbican where we've had 500 people take well, part. Well I was going to ask you So I'm you always get... thinking multifaceted of yeah. with this one project what impact could it have as a kit for media to help the campaign in terms of actual campaigning but in terms of interactivism as well can I create stuff that works on many layers that engages people another example because there's too many to discuss but the other extreme of that is i did a project with share action who came to me and said for three years they tried to get one of the biggest retail brands in the country to dis- have one meeting with them to discuss becoming a living wage employer yeah. and for three years the ceo had said no and share actions director who's one of my she rose she's an amazing campaigner called Catherine howitt which you should all look up and follow her on twitter we'll she, put links to her she's brilliant yeah. so she said she'd read my little book because my big big book hadn't came out by then and said what you do is so weird we tried all forms of traditional campaign and all we want is a meeting there's five weeks from now till the agm yep. of this company 
what do you think we could do? And I, so we sat in my garden in my shared accommodation at the time and said, okay, who's above the CEO, the board members, the CEO is a board member and has to listen to them. If he's not listening to your campaigners and he's not listening in other ways, he'll listen to the board. How do we engage the board? They're clearly not engaging at other AGMs where you've had placards or handed in bags of petitions. What if I get craftivists from across the country, just 14, because there's 14 board members, mm. who are who look and are part of their core customer base because they'll listen to them. We buy a share for each of those craftivists so that they're show, shareholders. I buy handkerchiefs from this company uh-huh. and I tell each craftivist that I knew would work really hard and it wasn't about their ego, it was very humble activism and they fitted the target demographic of the company. I said Google everything about your board member from what colours they wear to whether they're loud and flamboyant or shy, what are they passionate about find out on LinkedIn if they're a trustee of somewhere to see what makes them tick and create a bespoke handkerchief saying to them, don't blow it, use your power for good. We know you've got a big and a difficult job, but we want to encourage you in your job. And then we wrote wow. handwritten letters to go with them to say, I really want to encourage in your, you in your job. I'm a customer. I love your company. I love your staff. So I'm actually quite shocked as well that you don't pay the living wage because your staff are brilliant. The living wage makes sense not just for dignity for your staff, but also for staff retention, for efficiency, for PR other companies have done it so it makes business sense as well as ethical sense i'd love you to talk to the living wage and um, foundation and share action about becoming a living wage employer That's and we hand delivered them so this you, was you not delivered the hankies hand delivered them wrapped up in boxes so it wasn't a big hoo-ha of look at these hankies we've given we got the meeting that we asked for and then for 10 months we had lots of boring meetings and then after 10 months they announced they were paying the living wage to 50,000 staff That's and we went back to the agm to say well done board members not well done us as campaigners well done you we said thank you it'd be great if you were living wage accredited employer which you're not and talked about that That challenge but this the chair of the board took me aside which he didn't have to and said it was the most powerful campaign they'd ever experienced the living wage was not on their agenda whenever they met but they kept talking about what was on your hanky because they couldn't see each each other's hanky was completely completely unique and they had one for them one one each and then all of the letters were written by the craft of his saying I'd spent hours making your hanky I really want it to be a useful tool for you to do well in your job yeah. and here's one issue we think is a win-win so the hanky didn't say become a living wage employer that makes it transactional it was very quiet it wasn't all over social media yeah. we didn't I didn't want that I wanted it to be intimate activism so for me it's I always focus on what's the cause what do we want to change where can we be of use with craftivism as a tool what audiences can craftivism be useful for so it's always focused on being part of that positive change you want to see Amazing. and how and then <laughs> near the end and maybe it should be near the beginning is how can i make this sustainable well, we'll for come, me we'll come on to that. and it was interesting impact. um i often ask social funders how they learn to delegate and trust oh, other people. So hard. What's, what's so interesting about you is that you've in, you're trusting your team with creating beautiful I am, messaging but I give them and boundaries. Did, so did you would you did you look at what they wrote on those hankies? Oh yeah. First? And I gave them very oh. clear boundaries of this is the project, this is why it's important. Don't use capital letters, don't use exclamation marks. This is about what gift they will love. This isn't about whether you like the aesthetics of it or not. It's something that you have to put yourselves in their shoes as a board member and say, if I was this board member, what would encourage me? I have craft a thought questions in all my kits, which are three questions for while you're using the process. So if you are making a gift for a power holder, you think through, if I was a power holder, what's stopping me from being part of the solution? Is it because I have too many demands to make profit from my shareholders? Am I really busy? don't presume they're trying to do awful things try and empathize with them and make them something that will encourage them and not just scream at them which goes right back to what you were talking about at the beginning of this podcast with gandhi and and, yeah and also it's common sense like we know that 
comes to neuroscience as well. We know if mm. people scream at us, we close off. We go into fight, flight or freeze mode. Mm. Even if we agree with them, we physically can't think clearly when we're in survival mode. So for me, it's strategic activism, not to scream and shout at people, mm. but to encourage them and to say we believe the best in you, not the worst. So I had very clear guidelines of make sure it's gentle, make sure it's encouraging, make mm. sure it's something that you can show you haven't rushed it you've done it really carefully make sure your letter is positive again we know if people have rushed their handwriting so do it slow all of that stuff so it's even the handwriting is beautiful oh i mean even in the lovely. book i talk about yeah. what fonts are more powerful for gentle protest oh, i talk about what colors so yellow is a hopeful color everyone's going to read this book, there's by the so way. It's much fantastic. in there and people often reread it saying i read it once i've scribbled on it i'm going to read it again to help me with my own project because so there's great. a lot and it's that difficult thing of you want it a engage as many people as possible so maybe I should oversimplify it but my passion is I want to make real long term change mm. so to oversimplify stuff just to get more followers and more craftivists is not my goal mm. my goal I, my goal could be to sell as many kits as possible but it's not it's to engage people as deeply and thoughtfully as possible as active citizens as so it's clear you're you're, you're having incredible social impact at all sorts of different levels from the people who are actually trying. doing the, the embroidery or handwriting the little scrolls yeah. through to the, the companies that are changing their policy. Yeah, and charities who are now changing charities. the way they do campaigning. So I did a TED talk called Activism Needs Introverts. Over a million people have viewed it. So for the charity sector globally, I get constantly charity saying, can you help us engage yeah. introverts? Can you train us up in stuff? I get individuals saying, oh my word, finally I, I, it clicked that I'm not a bad activist because I burn out doing extrovert stuff. I'm an introvert. And we can have these amazing conversations about how, you know, a third to a half of the world are introverted. So we're, we're in the, you know, in the campaign space, we're not fulfilling the potential of campaigning yeah. by just doing extrovert so stuff. So exciting, so amazing. So I get people saying, just share loads of stuff to get more followers. I'm like, I spend actually far more time replying to people who often tag me in their own craftivism and I have to say like, what's your what's your re what's your strategy who are you trying to engage you yeah. know to try and help them be more strategic but in a loving way i, I could just say what you're doing is great but if i don't think it's effective i'll try and help them be more strategic Fantastic. so i spend a lot of time doing that which makes no business sense which doesn't pay and you're making your craft kits at home um, so tell us tell yeah. us about the tell us about the money side and also how oh, you know. know so let's go almost right back to the beginning we, we, how did you how have you earned your living? And, and, yeah. and I know that we can sponsor you as well. You can, you can adopt like, a never, craftivist. Never heard that before. When I first yeah. saw it and you said adopt a craftivist, I thought you meant loads of other people out yeah. there, but it's actually you. It, at the moment, it's we me. We can adopt you. you can ad and I'm going to adopt you, Sarah, uh, definitely. So, one, so, again, it's all, I mean, so much of my work's like trying to figure out as we go along which life is, yeah. isn't it? So after the getting the Save the Children job and getting lots of requests and trying to see, you know, things like, I didn't know what a daily rate was. I was brand new to all of that. Yeah. I'd only worked for, as a campaigner. Yeah. I've never done my own spreadsheets for budgeting yeah. and taxes. Yeah. And so... I was doing lots. I was doing that big project that felt really valuable and useful, and being paid as and a freelancer. Being paid, yeah. Um, Did you set up your own company? No, I work? was doing it all as a freelancer, yeah. um, which was st which I checked whether that was the right thing to do, and at the time it was. Mm -hmm. Now I'm a social enterprise. I am registering as a, as an educational charity. That's my next step, oh, that's interesting. which makes sense in terms of the work I do. Yeah. Um, but I was doing lots of events and workshops where I'd be paid little bits. And I had to leave London to write the book because more and more people were saying, all of the stuff you're saying, is it written down? And yeah. it wasn't. Yeah. And I knew at the time I'd done so much that I had enough to put in a book. Yeah. And this was the book, the, the, the craft the yellow book. book. Yeah. Yellow book, yeah. Yellow the gentle book. art of protest. Yeah. You, you did the earlier book. I did a little book of craft. And did you make any money from that? Yeah, a bit. And yeah. I still sell it quite well. Yeah. Um, you don't make a lot from books, but it opens doors mm. as well. Mm. And it reaches people. And then it felt right to do the bigger book. But I had to leave London. I, so for a year, I... Um, sofa surfed and house sat for people so yeah. I didn't have rent to pay uh -huh. I did wrote the book four days a week 10 till 6 
one day a week on The Craftivist, one day off. I gave myself 10 months to do it so I could come back to so London. You, you, but I, I was very strict on that. You were very disciplined. I person. had to be because I had I had a deadline and yeah. I wanted to get home to London. Where and did, you, did, it, did it go quite smoothly? No, of course it didn't. <laughs> it was a right pain. But I gave myself weekly, daily deadlines. So I had to... I'm not a natural writer. Any writer says how painful yeah. it is to write. Yeah. But I gave myself a deadline. I um, And then near the end, I was like, okay, I need to get back to London. I've written the book. But how am I going to survive financially? Yeah. So I thought, there's no way I can just keep doing little jobs. And that wasn't strategic in terms of impact. So I thought, okay, what's the way to do it? I really need, looking at activists throughout history, they have patrons, mm-hmm. which we don't mm-hmm. often talk about. I need patrons. And I thought, people adopt so many donkeys at Christmas. Why don't they adopt a craftivist? So, so I've I never thought, heard of anybody else doing this before. No, I it's, hadn't either. <laughs> so, and incredible. it was scary because I hate asking for money. But I thought, okay, I'm going to ask people to pay me £10 a month for 12 months. I'm going to ask enough that I'm on the living wage. Yeah. And then I've got a baseline that I can do other work on top of it. But I, it means I can pick work that's more impactful than just money gigs. Mm. And I'm saying a year so that there's a finite time. Because obviously by the end of the year, everything will be fixed. We know. You and know, has it worked? It's been, it's so useful, but it's been two and a half years and I still rely on my £10 a month from adopters but they know that and they also, I do a yearbook every year for my adopters to say what we've achieved Um, and I'm very honest with them if without their baseline I'd have to just do other bits and bobs Um, but it means also I've had time to apply for funding because there's so much demand it needs more than one of me Mm -hmm. definitely Mm -hmm. Um, which is scary because I don't particularly like managing people I've done it before I was going to ask you about that so So I like collaborating do you have you don't have a co-founder do you have a board or do you have anybody I'm setting up as a charity I'm going to have a board and I'm excited about that but scared because I'm a control freak but up till now you've been doing this for how long now? Well, you had your five years when you were doing it yeah, as a side Yeah, I've been doing project. it five years full time. And then five years full yeah. time. Yeah, and every year and I work that. with more more bigger projects. So I have I work with project managers for some projects. Uh-huh. I work with photographers, filmmakers. and So I, I have people that I can afford now to pay to help me do because yeah. they're amazing at what so, they do. So a gang of freelancers. Have a gang of freelancers. That you trust and know. Yeah, but it's definitely come to the stage now where there's a demand to get more stockists of the kits and the books and do more workshops that I don't have to deliver I could get other people to deliver but I'm stuck in that hard place of I don't have enough to pay people full time to do it but I know that if I had funding behind yeah. like seed funding I could and setting up as an educational charity what I do is teaching people craftivism and gentle protest yeah. and it'll be a charity but it'll be an unusual charity <laughs> because the goal is that I need that core funding and that seed funding yeah. for a team yeah. but part of that is to then sell more products and kits and services yeah. so that the charity isn't always relying on grants and foundations but it can actually generate a lot of its own money to keep it going and do you d- does any part of you wish that you could seriously make personal profit out of this what's you know obviously because a lot of commercial yeah. founders starting up their own business they're thinking oh i can sell my company for billions no, i can I do don't... a last minute dot com and this of... was interesting talking to the lawyers they were saying you know this doesn't make sense in terms of profit for you personally you Mm. could you know do the speaker gigs and everything on the side and I was like my goal is always my big goal is that gentle protest is seen as something really effective and sustainable for people and effective in campaigning and craftivism is one tool to do that really well so my goal is always how to show people how to be effective gentle protesters and craftivism engage people my grandmother I remember her goal was always to have enough money you don't have to think about money but often people with too much money worry about money and when you have not enough money you worry about money so I'd I always I'd love a healthy wage where I can live off a wage where I can not have to worry about money um but my goal is I don't want to sell it as a company. And that's the other thing is, and I've looked a lot at social enterprise stuff Mm. and CICs and all of that, but I don't want our motive to be profit. I always want it to be impact. And I want also people buying the kits and the resources to know that 
all of this money is going into helping people be effective craftivists and gentle protests. So the charity protesters. brand will so really that, help. So there's, there's pros and cons to both, but for me, the tip is that it makes sense to do yeah. it as an educational charity. Well, if I was a grant funder, I would be thrilled to fund you, and I'll, I'll absolutely help <laughs> you spread the Any grant funders listening, it, it, it is, I have never applied for funding. It's a whole new thing I'm trying to learn. It is incredible. And it's scary. Yeah. Um, but it's a big thing I've got to do, but I've never done it before and it scares the crap out of me. You'll be, br- <laughs> you'll be brilliant at it, the, re- the reluctant social the founder. The reluctant, that, yeah. But, but you, have, you, have, you have the most incredible, is it 15,000 15, so Twitter followers? Oh, 40,000. 40,000. And it's growing every and day. And Instagram as well, enormous. So we've got, yeah, so overall over three platforms, Instagram, Twitter and Facebook, Facebook, which are quite different audiences, yeah. it's over forty thousand yeah, together. It's really um, and then I get emails from people, and it's very active. So it's very, I don't just broadcast. A lot of it is conversational. So for me, it's not so much about the numbers. Numbers are great, but it is about how these are retweeting and resharing and commenting on stuff. And it's very active. It's very I mean, engaged audience. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah it's, it is a movement that you've created, isn't it? Really exciting. Well, Mike, but this is a difficulty. I don't want it to be, I'm a craftivist, that's all. I need people to let, know that craftivism is a tool. You're like, you don't have a petition movement. You don't have a march movement. This really should be people, whether you love craft or not, mm. people saying, where can craftivism be a useful tool in my activism, in my change making? Mm. And I want to be there to say, with all of the learning as a campaigner, all of the neuroscience, everything involved, this is what I think is most effective. <laughs> there's one there's one question I really want to ask you, which comes up again and again and again with the social founders, both at our events and in one-to-one discussions, which is those moments when you think, oh my God, I just can't do this anymore. Yeah. I can't, yeah. you know, I'm not good enough. Yeah. The imposter syndrome, the loneliness. We hear this again and, yeah. and again. Amen. <laughs> and what's so incredible about this network we've got of social founders and everybody else out there who's doing this is the people's ability to find the courage and the resilience to yeah. keep going. How, how do you do that? What, how, what advice would you give people? And how have you yeah. personally done that? And what I, is it that's, is it your Martin Luther King mug? What is, what is yeah, it that's kept you yeah. going? It's a roller times? coaster. Mm-hmm. And I regularly doubt myself and think, you know, I'll read the news and I limit how much news I read actually now because it's not always helpful. But I'm constantly saying, you know, I see something awful in the news and I think, this is awful and what am I doing? I'm asking people to slow down and stitch. (laughs) What is the point? But I'm lucky that I have, I get so many emails and social media things from people which are very long and really honest of people saying how my works helps them personally in in terms of changing their mind or their habits but Mm -hmm. also with some of their campaigns and I put them all in an email folder called my happy inbox so whenever so whenever I am it's my happy folder and it's in my inbox and whenever I get those I put them there and whenever I have a wobble I read through them and say I'm one piece of the jigsaw puzzle, so I have a tattoo of a jigsaw piece on my arm to say I'm not the whole puzzle to solve everything mm. and, um, you know, messiah complex issues that sometimes we can have, but I could be a really useful jigsaw piece within the puzzle doing what I do that's clearly helping people and that keeps me going. And then I'm always monitoring what I can improve on, but it's a constant problem, you know, especially when you've got financial concerns, especially when you're... Yeah. I work crazy hours and then I neglect family and friends, which I'm sure many listeners will um, connect with. Mm. So I'm, I'm always having those doubts. So I have to remind myself that campaigning's hard. It's hard sometimes. You, some things are immeasurable. Some of the impact you have, you can't capture actually. Yeah, yeah. Or people get back to me 10 years later and say, that thing we did. You know, I make it. I I do this differently now because of that thing we did a few years ago. So that keeps me going. So it's the feedback. From the, the feedback keeps me going. I think if I genuinely think if anyone was doing what I do better, I'd move on and do something else because uh-huh. I'm definitely motivated by how can I make something that's useful that's yeah. not already out there, yeah. which is why coming back to your question about people who want to be founders, I always challenge people and say, well, if you don't have a a thing that you think is lacking in the world and you're the right person to do it, I'd rather you not be a founder. If you're just, if you want to be a founder and latch onto something, you've got your motives the wrong way Mm round. I really think you need to say, 
is there a thing that is needed in the world mm -hmm. and are are there people or organizations that can fill that need and if there isn't am i the right person to do it yeah. and i might not be if there's someone else i often get requested and i say i can't do it but this person's really good at that and i'll yeah, yeah, signpost yeah. them off so i think it for me it's there's still a gaping hole for me that gentle protest I think is really powerful whether it's craft or whether it's gentle conversations yeah. with people to help them that I think is emotional intelligence is lacking in activism yeah, yeah. Um, and it's really hard to do and I really want to be part of that change um, but then I also I when I, I when I'm exhausted I had a meeting recently and um I was absolutely exhausted, working crazy hours. And then at the end, the woman said, and we were working on a project, and the woman said, oh, what are you excited about at the moment? And I went on and on about how I want a craftivism caravan to take around the country and capture on film and audio, nice. all of this yeah. impact we're having that we haven't captured. Yeah. And I suddenly went from being exhausted to now talking to you as well, being so energized because I do... I do believe in my work. You're and absolutely I, passionate still about it. And I'm passionate. Really. And there's yeah. so much more I want to do that I haven't done. And that yeah. keeps me going. Yeah. And I genuinely love it. But I think with any founder, burnout is a big issue that we all need to talk about more. Yeah. And I remember going to one of your breakfasts yes. with social founders. And for me, stuff like that really reminds me that even the most successful social founder will talk about their insecurities yes. or their failures. The ones that sound... Um, you know, people who had just started, often I still have the same concerns, like, but wouldn't it be great if the, I did have staff all like, over the world so it could be more successful? And well, I haven't got there. We're going we're gonna to really watch your, your journey with interest over the next few years. But because if, I, if I carry on being wonder, a one-woman band, does that make me a failure as well? And, well these are the whole these dilemmas are the that founders have, isn't yeah. it? And yeah. whether, you know, whether whether you will enjoy working with a bigger team will mm. it be you know will it really change will it will it liberate you yeah, or yeah. will it actually bog you down yeah. and, and create all, all new things. pressures that you yeah. don't want and again having a board yeah and how how will that board feel about and you as a founder and there's definitely been times i think where i've self-sabotaged to stay small which i think is really that's important for founders to discuss that's of when really, do we really take an arrogant leap and when do we self-sabotage and are we aware of that? So the journey that you'll go on over the next few years will be a huge leap into, leap. The, into yeah. the dark, into the light. It's just really to see scary, how... actually. It does feel like a tipping point. Yeah. Well, Sarah, it's been amazing talking to you. I hope it's been useful. For really, people. really, really mm. fantastic. And uh, we hope to hear lots more of you, actually, because I think what following your journey around setting up the charity, yeah, that's a exciting. Board for the first time, employing staff, maybe. Yeah, yeah. will be really, really interesting. And how you scale up so that you're not having yeah. to make the kits at home. Yeah, although I mean, you'll I, miss that, won't I you? I probably will miss yeah, it. Yeah. yeah. So maybe we need a. a a kit for founders, that, for potential <laughs> Don't founders. Don't give me more work. <laughs> what? <laughs> Actually, what I would love is um, a, is a beautiful hand-embroidered badge for no, founders. Like it's, it's a That's footprint, what... and it's about inner activism of what steps are you taking that have positive impact, what's your intent daily, yeah. but what's your long-term journey, and that you keep as a physical reminder of Am I on autopilot? What impact am I having daily nice. and long term? And that is a good thing for founders to yeah. say, okay, where can I have the most impact? Because we all have impact whether we like it or not, and it's just trying to help it be a positive impact. Excellent. Mm. Excellent, excellent. So tread lightly. Well, <laughs> congratulations on everything you're doing. And you too. for all our listeners, we'll really push your book. Oh, uh, please the fact that it's going, do. coming out in paperback is going to be yeah. everywhere, isn't it? And do, you know, founders do chat to me on social media and ask me, you know, big questions. I'm oh, quite honest. Oh, that'd be brilliant. Because um, we do, I think this community is so important for us yeah. to share and discuss with yeah, each other. Yeah, and I, hopefully you'll come along to some more of our events I totally as well. Will. Yeah, because I travel a lot, but I absolutely yeah. would love to. Good. Yeah. Okay, so well, thank you very, very much. Thank you. And speak soon. Definitely. You can follow Sarah on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook at Craftivist Collective. And you can order Sarah's wonderful book and other craftivist tools at craftivist-collective.com. Do subscribe to the podcast. We have some fantastic guests coming up. You can also sign up to our newsletter on our website, www.socialfounder.org. 
Social Founder Stories is brought to you in association with Kiva, the Center for Innovation in Voluntary Action. You can find out more about Kiva and support their innovative work at www.kiva.org.uk. Thank you.